Let us have a moment of silence to prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning. Amen. Would you please stand? Would you take your hymnals and open to number 26? We'll be singing, Why Should He Love Me So? Please stand.
Please be seated. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I love it. All those young voices is great. <laughs> Good morning to everyone and a welcome as well to all of you that are joining us from the Elmcrest Manor this morning through closed circuit cable television. I have some announcements to make. A reminder, our Board of Christian Education meeting, we will be holding it uh, after worship service today. Uh, we also have our family fun game day today, right after the service, and so we would invite all of you to come down and uh, enjoy some uh, chili and baked potato on a, do a free will donation basis, and then play some games. We hope you brought board games, cards, whatever it is that you like to play. Uh, we'll be doing that after service as well. Uh, APOW after school program will be meeting uh, this Wednesday from 3.15 to 4.30 p.m. as it does uh, here on each Wednesday when public school is in session and that's open to everyone kindergarten through sixth grade. Uh, we have our church annual meeting coming up uh, next week and you have the details for that in your bulletin. One other note about that, we do still need to have uh, one other person to uh, be nominated for the church council and so if you're willing to uh, to do that let us know uh, otherwise we'll be taking nominations well we'll be taking nominations from the floor at the meeting please when you come uh, bring your annual report with you to the meeting february is our mission month for crew last week troy shirley came and he was our guest speaker and he spoke to us and uh, the details for giving to that missions organization are there in your bulletin. Uh, regarding the church newsletter, uh, if there's anyone here that is not getting our monthly newsletter and you would like to get it, please uh, write your name and address down and give it to me uh, or to the church secretary. I guess Anita's not feeling well, she's not here today, but give it to me or even one of the ushers for that matter and, and uh, we'll add you to the list so the next time the newsletter comes out, uh, you can get it. Are there any other announcements to be made at this time? If there are, just come to the microphone at this time, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I know Pastor Eddie talked a bit about the baked potato bar, but yeah, we have some games downstairs, a lot of them, and we have a pinochle tournament that, yeah, that's pretty fun, and there's a lot of cards and stuff. And there's a lot of chili and a lot of um, baked potatoes. So come on down, eat some food, play some games. It's really fun. Thank you. Thank you, Sistine. Anyone else with an announcement? Uh, I am. I know Gerald Springer has a birthday. Do we have other birthdays? Desiree. And then, um, to Esther, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're doing the Ten Commandments right now. <laughs> Something about bearing faults. Uh, oh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Esther and Gerald and Desiree. Anyone else? I couldn't hear you. Oh, Strider. Okay. So there's four birthdays. Any others? 35th anniversary for Barry and Michelle. All right. Kendall? Kendall Earhart has a birthday. Anything else? Yes. You're waving at me. Do you have a birthday? No. Okay. <laughs> I flunked sign language 101, I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, we have a bunch of birth birthdays and an anniversary, so let's sing happy birthday, dear friends. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear friends. Happy birthday to you. And anniversary. It's too much to squeeze in when we're singing it. Okay, for our pulpit humor, a mother was preparing pancakes for her sons, Kevin, who was five, and Ryan, who was three. And so the boys got into an argument about who was going to get the first pancake. And the mother saw the argument, and she saw this as an opportunity to teach a moral lesson. So she said this to her two boys. If Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Kevin turned to his younger brother and said, Ryan, you be Jesus. <laughs> well, these kids are pretty smart, huh? Okay. Well, if we have nothing further by way of announcements, we'll turn it over to the Sunday school at this time. singing Praise the Lord by Natalie Slinger.
Good morning. Our preschool through second graders learned a lot about Valentine's Day and God's love for us. So this morning we have just a quick little program. We have some of our favorite Bible verses about God's love and a special song for you. He loved because he loved us. First John 19. Let us love one another because love is of God. First John chapter 4, verse 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Let all that you do be done in love. First, what? Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14. I hope the love of Jesus fills your heart with joy on Valentine's Day and always. Sorry. <laughs> Mic check. You okay in the back? It sounds good from up here. We got thumbs up. Thank you. Okay, that tells me we're good. Are you all ready to say good morning? Good morning. Come on, that's pitiful. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning! There we go. I see the dust coming from the rafters. That's a good thing in this case. Good morning. There is no dust. Blame the janitor, right? <laughs> okay, well, I need you to uh, help me with some math this morning. So I brought... A board. Does anybody know what this board is called? There's a name for it. Whiteboard. Whiteboard, yes. Um, they've had different names. We used to call them melane boards. Uh, another name for it is dry erase board. Confusing board. Well, depending on what I write on here, it might be. I don't know. Yeah, okay. So let's, let's see how good your math is. If I write this up here, if I put this, plus this, what does that equal? Zero. Zero. What about if I do this? What does that equal? Zero plus one equals one. What about this? 
Two plus zero equals. What about this? Zero plus three equals. Oh. Hmm. Are you paying attention now? There might be a trick coming up. What is four plus zero equal? All right, do you see a pattern right here? What is the pattern? So if that's the pattern, what's the next number that's going to go up? Five. Six? All right, so we have five, so we know then that two plus two equals five, right? Not, but wait a minute, one, zero, one, two, three, four, five. So two plus two must equals five, right? Uh, are you saying that I made a mistake? Not bashful about that, right? Well, okay, so if I made a mistake, what can I do to fix it? I can erase it. Mm. Start over again. All right, so I have this paper towel, and if I, I can erase the five, and then what should I put there instead? Four. Okay, so two plus two equals four. Now let me ask you something. Do you ever make mistakes? Who said no? <laughs> Well, I, I think if we're honest, we'll have to say that all of us make mistakes sometimes. And, um, and, and when we're doing math, yeah, and when we, when we do math, we can fix our mistake by erasing it. But what about if we do something that's wrong? How can we fix that? Let me redo it. So, what, what if you do something wrong? There's a name for it if you do something wrong. It's not exactly the... What is it? Sin. Yeah. So, when you do something wrong, it's called sin. S-I-N. Who can think of some sins that we do? Just, just say them. Stealing. Don't listen to your parents. Steal. Lying. Um, don't listen to your parents. Okay, disobedience. I'll just abbreviate. What else? A fighting? Punching? Fighting and kicking your butt. <laughs> fighting. What else? You think of some other ones? How about this one? This one's maybe a little more serious. M-U-R-D-E-R. -E what is that? Murder. What does that mean? Killing someone, yeah. So these, yeah, so these are all types of sin, right? So now, when we're doing math, we can just erase it, right? But how do, how do we get rid of sin? How do we get rid of this stuff? You can't? Well, there's something we can do. Pray, that's part of it. Who do we pray to? God. And what do we say to God? I'm sorry for my sin, and I ask you to forgive me. Now, how is it that God can forgive us? Who did something special for us that makes it possible for us to be forgiven? Jesus died on the cross. Very good. And because Jesus died on the cross... When we come to him and we ask for forgiveness of our sins, what does he do? He forgives us. And you know, the Bible says that in a special way. In the Old Testament, when talking about sin, the Bible says when we confess our sin and we ask Jesus or God to forgive us, that he, in essence, he erases our sin. It says he remembers it no more. So I brought with me an eraser, and whose name is on the eraser? Jesus' Jesus's name. Confess means you say that you're sorry, that you did it, and you're sorry that you did it. That's what it means. So, with Jesus, 
we can, he, we can have our sins erased so that God remembers them no more. And if I were to ask you five months from now what I wrote on that board, you would remember it no more. Okay? All right, let's pray about that right now. Father God, we give you thanks for this day, that you make it possible for us to be forgiven of our sins. We know that when we make mistakes, most of the time we can fix them when it comes to math and other things. But when it comes to sin, we know that the only eraser for that is your son Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross. And so we thank you that we can come to you and have forgiveness of our sins merely by asking you to do it for us. And that you remember our sin no more and you continue to love us all the time. Amen. Okay, we're done. this time, congregation, would you please stand? Would you take your bulletin? We'll be singing the song, As the Deer. Please stand. remain standing and take a moment to meet and greet one another.
If you take your bulletin, you'll see there a, a listing of our praises and prayer requests. I'm aware of a couple of other things that aren't there. Uh, Lorraine Schwinkendorf apparently is in the hospital and had a stroke, so we want to be lifting her up in prayer. And then some congratulations are in order. Uh, Ty and Clarissa Kruger, Kruger on the birth of their son, Brian Sebastian Kruger, who was born February 7th, weighed 8 pounds, 6 ounces. Are there any other announcements? Prayer requests, updates, anything of that sort before we go to the Lord in prayer. Anyone in front of me first? Anyone behind me? My peripheral vision senses somebody coming. <laughs> right behind you. Uh, you may remember about a year ago, uh, we lifted up a young lady from our community. Miranda is her name. Uh, she works for the city uh, down at the auditorium. And a little over a year ago, uh, she had a little baby girl. Her name is Sophia. And uh, they knew at that time that Sophia had some problems with her heart. And um, now the doctors have told Miranda that Sophia needs to have uh, surgery on her heart. Um, one of the arteries has wrapped around her esophagus, and they tell her that that will continue to get worse as she gets older. So the time to do it is now. And uh, so she will uh, have surgery on the 26th of February in Minneapolis. Um, the, the doctors assure Miranda that all things will go well, and it's a procedure that they have done um, quite often. So uh, we pray that Sophia will be will be well, but um, I would ask that we lift up Miranda as well. Um, she's, a, she's a single mom. She has three kids, and she's having a pretty tough time. So I would just ask that uh, we remember them in our prayers. Dane, if you can, if there's something you can think of on a practical basis that we can do for them, then, you know, let, let us know in the future. I'll just tack on a little bit here. I don't know if you uh, really know who this gal is, but at any rate, uh, she works in the auditorium. She's a, a janitor, and she she's more than a janitor. She is a working fool. She's very, very busy all, when she's in there. If you've noticed or anybody that's had parties in there, she's painted the rooms and the, the floor. She had her brother come in, I believe, and help her with the floors so those old stinky yellow floors are not that way anymore. She's just uh, uh, something else. And uh, when she was going to have this baby, well, then Andy went out and dug out the old uh, bassinet from the granary and he cleaned that up and he took that in she brought the baby with her uh, very good baby very good baby considering the the heart troubles but uh, she would sleep in the and her mother would work so um, that's that's a little bit of who she is and um, uh, I believe that the, another way to tell you who she is is a Candace Johnson is that Candace is her mother no who? Jenny Hughes. Yeah, Jenny, yeah, whatever her name is now. <laughs> but uh, that would be um, who her mother is. So uh, anyway, that's, that's, I just have a little more to tack on here. Um, I spent the weekend with um, my daughter-in-law, Leanne McCowan, and um, uh, we were driving down the road to, she was driving to Fargo. Grand, Grand Forks, um, Moorhead, uh, to watch, we went to watch Maya, well, and the rest of the girls play hockey, <laughs> anyway, um, talking about her cancer and so forth, and and uh, she's not taking anything, I think I've said that before, she's um, completely uh, just, 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 uh, the Lord is, is taking care of her, and uh, LaDonna and I, we told her that Oh, she's in our bulletin. Oh, I am? I said, yes, we, 
we keep people in our prayers even if they don't belong to our church or they, anyway if they're related to someone or somebody knows them and she was just shocked that we would uh, still have her in our bulletin and still be praying for her at any rate um, she's going along the, some of the sores from her um, allergic reaction and that's what it is if she if the brain tumors uh, come back then she'll have to take that medicine and which she's allergic to so I told her well I just believe that you won't have to take that medicine ever again I believe that there's a healing going on it's a slow one but but I'm gonna present it to our church again and we'll pray for you and oh all the other sick people there's so many that are that aren't feeling well and here our friend Lorraine I had just asked about her the other day and and uh, isn't that something why don't we make a phone call or go to these people when we think about it we need to do that so Lorraine is a very proud lady and uh, and this probably is a very <laughs> very uh, a terrible thing for to happen to her so we'll have to keep in her, our, her in our prayers and <clears throat> And I was, I just can't, I can't be quiet yet, um, because I have to, I was reading through the, the, the big book that we got in mail, and uh, the, the annual reports, let's put it that way, and I just started thinking, holy cow, all this stuff is going on in this church, in this community, and, and I'm very proud of the adults, but even more so for you kids. Holy cow, you are just marvelous. And just look at, we filled up the whole front of the church here twice today already. And um, the people, there are, you know, there are leaders that are working with these kids and all the different <laughs> things they're doing from shoe boxes to soup kitchen and, and here and there and everything else. So, you know, we've really got something going here. I, uh, I have to say that I, I, I'm very proud to be part of part of this community and been here all my life and and uh, and I just plan on staying here. So, thank you for everything. Thank you for your prayers and and thanks for this little guy back here. And of course, he's got a wife that kind of hangs on to him. And we got these girls here that just keep going and just like the Energizer Bunny. Thank you. Let us take a moment then to speak to the Lord in the privacy of our hearts. That will be followed by a pastoral prayer. Then together we'll say the Lord's Prayer. Let's come to his throne of grace at this time. Father God, as Foxy mentioned, we, we do have so much to be thankful for here at Peace Church and, and in our community at large, and we know that your word says that all good things come from you, and so we give you the praise and the honor and the glory for the many kinds of blessings that we do have here. We also come as needy people as we lift up those who have suffering of one kind or another. Most recently, we heard about Lorraine, who's in the hospital, who had a stroke. We ask that you would bring healing for her. We think about what Dane shared with us this morning. We think about Sophia, who will have surgery, and her mom, Miranda, and the struggle it is to be a single parent financially and other ways. Father, open up doors of ministry and opportunity for them that we might find a way to minister to them, to be of help in some way. We also especially ask for wisdom and discernment on the part of the medical personnel as Sophia goes and has surgery. We ask that it will go smoothly, without problem, and without complication of any kind. For the rest here, Lord, you know everyone that's on this list and even more than we've put here. Whatever their needs, their burdens, their concerns may happen to be, we ask that you would bring one into their life, whatever it is that they happen to need. We give you special thanks today 
for the birth of a young boy, the birth of Brian Sebastian Kruger. We ask that you would put your Holy Spirit upon him even at his young age, that you would bring him to a point in his life where he would make a decision to accept Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. For these and so many other things, we lift up our hearts to you in prayer as we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Powerful and loving God, this offering is indeed a special time. It's a time when we acknowledge our weakness, but also your strength. We give you money. You gave your very life for us. We give you some of our time, and you are with us each and every moment of every day. This is a special time because we are assured that our giving is special to you. In giving, we admit that we cannot save ourselves, but we trust in your power. We ask, O oh God, that you would receive these gifts as an expression of our thankfulness for all of the many things that you mean in our lives. We placed our trust in you, and through your promises and through your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Please rise for offertory response. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O oh God, from thee. May we thy bounties thus, as stewards true receive, and gladly as thou blessed us, to thee our first fruits give. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Turn with me, if you would, please, in your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. We're going to be reading uh, verse 7 today for our sermon text, and then this is a two-part sermon, as you see, so we'll be using that same verse next time. We're going to be talking about the insanity of profanity. As we continue this sermon series on the Ten Commandments, I've included this week a, a little insert outline of the two parts of the sermon uh, just because there was some terminology in there. Exodus chapter 20 verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses 
his name. Here and ends the reading of God's holy word. Many years ago, Time Magazine ran an article about a truck driver. The truck driver was stopped by the police and he was arrested for drunk driving as well as for disorderly conduct. And as soon as the policeman started talking with the truck driver, he began yelling at the police officer and swearing at the police officer and, and cursing, using the name of God, misusing God's name, taking God's name in vain. And this continued during the whole time when he was being taken down to the police station. It continued there. They brought the individual before the magistrate or the judge, and the swearing and the cursing and taking God's name in vain continued in front of the judge. Now, according to the law at that time, the maximum sentence that the judge could give this truck driver was a $100 fine and 30 days in jail. But the judge wasn't satisfied with this. So he went to his office, he dusted off some old, old law books, and he found a special provision in there that it had to do with taking the name of the Lord God in vain. He came back and he gave the individual an additional 30 days in jail and an additional $100 fine. In other words, he doubled what was the original uh, law. And the editor of Time Magazine said this about what this judge, this magistrate had done, and I quote, I feel like this is cruel and unusual punishment, end of quote. Now, the, the editor didn't have a big deal about the initial fine, but he objected to the fact that the judge gave him additional jail time and additional financial penalty for taking the name of the Lord in vain. That was his reaction. He, he apparently did not feel that misusing the name of God was a big deal. But I want to tell you, friends, very clearly that at least from God's perspective, it is a big deal, and it is a very big deal. About 3,000 years ago, during the time of Moses and Aaron, if someone misused the name of the Lord, they could actually get the death penalty. That's pretty serious. We read in this scripture uh, in Leviticus 24, 15, and 16, it says, For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Some translation around the saying misuses, uses the word, takes his name in vain. We're looking at Ten Commandments. Did you know that two of the Ten Commandments deal with sins of the tongue? Look that over sometime. Two of the Ten Commandments deal with sins of the tongue. This third commandment deals with profanity. The ninth commandment deals with perjury. The third commandment is about talking trash. The ninth commandment tells us about telling the truth. The third commandment calls for holy language. The ninth commandment calls for honest language. Why is this commandment so important, especially in a day and age like ours where cursing and taking God's name, misusing God's name is just kind of everyday street talk for a lot of people. Because, you see, this third commandment deals with the name of God. We have a precious designation of God's name, a precious designation, and we should take it more seriously. People don't take God's name very seriously anymore, but... Many years ago, they took it to the ultimate extreme. It wasn't just the death penalty. Even, even in writing the name of God required a lot of religious ritual back then. Back when a Hebrew was translating the Bible, when he came upon the name of God, say he was copying a scroll, for example, he came to the name of God, he'd put the pen down. He'd go off and he'd spend some time in prayer and fasting. Then he would take a complete bath and wash himself. Then he would take the pen that he was writing with before and he would throw it away. 
start with a brand new quill. Then he would actually write the name of God on the scroll. Then he'd throw that pen away and start with another one. Then he would take off all of his clothes and he would burn them. He'd get another pen. And the ritual would start all over again. Whenever he was translating or copying scripture, whenever he came to the specific name of God, they would go through that ritual every single time. Now you say, well, that's kind of dumb, that's kind of stupid, that's kind of a waste of time, and maybe in a way it is, but they had a great respect and reverence for God and for the name of God, which we don't have anymore. I think we've kind of gone to the other extreme in American culture. The Hebrews were terrified of misusing the name of God, and so they actually quit using it, saying it altogether. And you, even in the New Testament, a lot of times when they're referencing God, they'll use the word Adonai, which means Lord, rather than actually say God's name. Names had great significance back then. They tend not to so much anymore. When we name a person as a parent, well, that tells you who that person is. When you, when you say that name, hopefully you're going to get a response of, of some kind. <laughs> but back in the days... Of the Hebrews, a name represented the very character of the individual. It wasn't just a name they were called by. They associated the character of the individual with the name that they had given to that boy or to that girl. And you see, every name that we have for God in the Bible reveals something about the character of God. The character of God. Of God. Let me give you some examples. In Genesis 1 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That name, God, there in Genesis 1 1, literally means the strong, faithful God. God is the God of power, He is omnipotent. Remember the prefix omni means all, and potent means powerful. I like the image of if it's a spring day and you're, you're, you're riding around town somewhere, you're on a trip somewhere and you have the window cracked and there's a dead skunk up ahead. That's potent. That's a powerful smell. But God is all powerful. He is the creator of heaven and earth. And since God is a God of power, it is dangerous to misuse the name of God. God is also the God of preeminence. Not only is he creator, but he's preeminent means that he's our boss, he's our master, he's our Lord, he's our, should I say it, CEO, to use a modern term. He's in charge of our lives, or he's supposed to be, we're supposed to let him. He is, in the Hebrew, the God of power, he is Elohim. The faithful God. He is Adonai, Lord. If someone is your Lord, that means they're in charge of you. They're in charge of your life. You know, and we all, we all love the, the salvation part of Jesus. But the Lord part, that's the hard part for all of us, isn't it? And you see, since God is preeminent, then it's disobedient to misuse the name of God. God is also the God of possession. He is Eliel in Hebrew. It speaks of possession. He is the possessor of heaven and earth. He is the possession of the one who owns us. It is disrespectful to use God's name in vain. God is also the God of provision. He is God Almighty. Every once in a great while I can remember Cayenne singing El Shaddai. I love that song. El Shaddai, El Shaddai. El Ayana Adonai. El Shaddai means God Almighty. God is the God of provision. He is capable of everything. It also means that he is the sustainer of life. He's the sustainer of life. You and I wouldn't be alive for one second without God. I don't care about this heartbeat stuff and this brainwave stuff. I get all that medical stuff. But that's not where your life ultimately comes from. God is the God of provision. And when you disrespect his name, you are dishonoring him 
as well. In Proverbs 30 and verse 8 in the NIV, it says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. And then he goes on and he says, Don't give me poverty. I don't want to be poor lest I steal and dishonor the name of God. We dishonor the name of God when we misuse his name because he is the God of provision. Every name that you find in the Bible represents some character trait of God. All right, let's go to Roman numeral two if you're following along on the sermon outline. The profane desecration of God's name. There are, there are three main ways, there's others, but there's three main ways that you can misuse the name of God. The profane desecration of God's name. Look at verse seven in your Bible, Exodus chapter 20 in verse seven. King James says it this way, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The NIV translates it a little differently, but it means the same thing. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And so there's three ways that you can take God's name in vain or misuse his name. The first is what I'm calling profanity. That can come in verbal form or it can come in written form. We've all been in places where we see graffiti on walls, hotel motel restaurants, airports, um, subways, uh, drive along places in the city, and you will see graffiti on the walls. You will also see paintings that tell you which gang is in charge of that area of the city, and if you don't belong to that area of the city and that gang, you better not be there. So there's different forms of graffiti that you can find. But why is God's name so sacred to God? Well, I, I like the way one man explained this particular commandment, and he explained it in terms of trademark property. Trademark property. I'll quote what he said about that. One way for a modern American to begin to understand this commandment is to treat God's name as trademark property. In order to gain widespread distribution for his copyright repair manual, the Bible, and also to capture greater market share for his authorized franchise, the church, God has graciously licensed the use of his name to anyone who will use it according to his written instructions. It needs to be understood, however, that God's name has not been released into the public domain. God retains legal control over his name, and he threatens serious penalties against the unauthorized use of this supremely valuable property. All trademark violations will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law, and the prosecutor, judge, and jury, and enforcer is God. End of quote. Wow. it's pretty serious, huh? So we've got to be careful about how we use God's name. We don't want to profane it. That word profane comes actually from two Latin words, pro, which means out of. It has other prefix meanings as well, of course, but here we're talking about out of, and feinen, which means temple, out of the temple. And you see, profanity is when you take the name of the God, of God out of the church, you take the name of God out of heaven, you take the name of God out of the word of God, and you drag it through the muck and the mire of this world. That's what profanity is. And we get angry sometimes and we get frustrated and we see, say things like damn it or damn you or damn so and so and those kinds of things. When you say that, just stop and take a moment and, and think about what you're doing. You're asking God to send that person to hell for all of eternity. That's what you're asking God to do. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever is in our heart, whatever we're feeling and experiencing, whatever emotion we're experiencing, that, that's usually what comes out of the mouth. And so what we say verbally is an expression or an evidence of what's going on with us internally at the moment. Profanity ultimately reveals a rotten character a rotten character, at least at the moment. 
If a man's mouth is profane, his heart is going to be profanity. Profanity also reveals, I think, a weak and pathetic mind. Lord Byron once said of a friend of his, he knew not what to say, so he cursed. <laughs> Even secondhand cursing, if you will, can be dangerous. And we won't go into the darns and those kinds of things. There is a story about a little girl that was out at her grandfather's house and she was playing in the yard and she stubbed her toe on a rock and she said, darn it, when she stubbed her toe. And the grandfather heard it and thought he would teach her a lesson. So he pulled her over and he said, honey, you're a sweet little girl and you don't need to talk like that. And he said, I want to make you a promise, honey. If you will promise never to say that word again, I'll give you a dime. And she said, all right, I'll never say that word again. So the grandfather gave her a dime. Well, a couple of days later, she came over to her grandfather's house, and she was really excited. She says, Grandpa, I'm, I'm really excited today. And he said, well, why is that? She said, I learned a word at school today that's worth half a dollar. <laughs> There's a future entrepreneur, I'm sure. <laughs> But profanity is also a ridiculous sin. It accomplishes absolutely nothing. It's just plain kind of stupid. Let, let's say a, a man or a woman goes out and they commit adultery, okay? Well, what did they get from it? Okay, well, they, they fulfilled their lust. At least they got something in return for what they did, right? Or let's say that a person go out, goes out and they, and they steal something. <clears throat> well, at least they got the benefit of whatever it was that they stole, at least until they get caught, okay? But when you swear, when you misuse God's name, you don't get anything as a benefit from it. Absolutely nothing. If you're driving along and you get a flat tire and you get out of the car and you kick your tire and you swear at it, that isn't going to put the air back in the tire. Your cursing didn't do you any good. No. Nope. If you're driving along on the highway and some idiot cuts you off and you get mad and you swear at him, what good does that do? He's not going to stop and apologize. Or you're out on the golf course and you hit one a mile, but it slices way off to the right and you get mad and you curse. Well, that's not going to make the ball come back onto the fairway. There's no benefit to profanity. And God says, if you use my name in vain, I will not hold him guiltless. We'll stop there with part two next time. you would please stand and open in your Bibles to number 458. We'll be singing, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. Verses 1 and 4. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let 